Last weekend, we held the very first debatable InterVarsity. This is a post-debate analysis that was originally released during that tournament. We wanted to release it on Spotify as well so that people who missed out on the tournament could also listen in on what we were discussing for that tournament. The theme for this round is education. Just a background for this motion, when we were in primary and secondary school, we would have to do the flag ceremony every morning as part of an effort to instill nationalism in the youth. Nationalistic education is debatable in and of itself but it's especially debatable in the context of young nations in post-conflict states that are recovering from strife and internal conflicts. This begs the question, should we stop trying to instill nationalism in these schools? The motion reads, This House believes that post-conflict states should not instill nationalism through the educational system. We'd like to thank Mikel Neri for contributing this motion and for letting them be interviewed for this post-debate analysis. everyone, welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts Nina and Kyle. I'm Kyle. I'm Nina. Today we're talking about the education motion for our very first Debatable InterVarsity. We are so happy to be joined with our motion contributor Mikel Neri. Mikel is a national champion, an Asian sporter finalist, and an Austral's Octu finalist. He's also a coach for Metaspeak, a Philippine-based debate academy with lessons made for online learning. He also wants you to know, by the way, that his record for Sky Wars in Minecraft is over 1,400 wins. The most important part, you know. So welcome to the show, (laughs) Miguel. Hello. How are you guys doing? We're absolutely fine now that you're here. Whoa! So the motion (laughs) that we're going to be discussing today is this house believes that post-conflict states should not instill nationalism through the education system. So you agreed to be our motion contributor for education. Um, what yeah. is it about education motions that make them so important to learn about and more importantly for our purposes? What is it? Why is it so important that we get to debate about them? Okay, so I think it's like two main things. So I think in terms of benefits for particularly newer debaters, I think it's always good to debate education topics. One is because I think it's broadly accessible when you start debating. Um, obviously, you're still in your school, either whether it be high school or university. So it's relatable to a degree. But I think secondly, it's really important because it's a good way of teaching a specific type of analysis that might be specific to BP debating or parliamentary debating that is different from you know a lot of different formats that might be more research-based. So a lot of analytical skills around structural functionalism are developed through education. I think it's a good model to figure out or to apply that lens and figure out how certain institutions influence society and interact with other institutions. I think education is one of the clearest demonstrations of that. So it's a really good area for newer debaters to develop that specific skill. But also, I think it's also a lot, well, it's it's really good for more advanced debaters to, to debate because it could interact with a lot of different um, nuances, especially with regard to this particular motion, you have a number of different moving parts that interact with each other to make a unique debate. Yeah, so I completely agree. I think education motions, especially now, are becoming a rather hot topic again, given the rise of online classes, as well as how they manifest. Um, In particular societies, I mean, in the Philippines, we see a lot of debates about education right now, um, given changes with curriculums and shifts to K-12. to But for this motion in particular, what I was curious about or what really caught my attention was the idea of nationalism. And I was wondering, for the purposes of this motion, if you were on government or opposition, what would be the most strategic way or how would you define nationalism in this context? Yeah, so I would sort of break down the definition into two things. I think the first one is like the conceptual definition of nationalism. So I think while you can be as academically precise as you want, I think the most simple um, definition is basically it is an ideology around the notion that citizens should prioritize the identity of being a member of a nation state um, over other potential identity groups, for instance, your religion or your ethnicity. But in practice, I think what this looks like when you're defining the motion is probably things like using a national language as a medium of instruction, maybe teaching a national language at all, teaching you know a lot of different national symbols like national food, sports, heroes, and also just broadly speaking, the values of the nation. So I think that's 
those are the, the specific things you would likely be teaching in the education system. So I think that's primarily what the debate would focus on when you talk about nationalism. So why is it about, why is it about nationalism through the educational system specifically? Like I imagine that a post-conflict society would have a lot of similar measures, Siguro, like a flag law, uh, having an official language, national museums, those kinds of stuff. Why are we talking about schools in particular? So I think the specific nuance to schools in a post-conflict society is that in a lot of ways, the schools are the most moldable institution or you know individuals in society. It's probably very, very difficult, for instance, to impose a national identity on different ethnic groups that have just resolved a conflict where tension still exists. It's probably not the case for with regard to students in an education system. You know, since they're a lot younger, they like their biases are less static. It's a lot easier to inculcate, either inculcate something like nationalism or completely omit that. So I think that it is not uh, the education system alone or a post-conflict society alone, but the interaction of those two concepts, which makes for an interesting nuance for the debate. So let's go now to the particulars of each side. So let's start with government first. I think that setting it up in a post-conflict state, as you mentioned, um, has a lot of nuances already. But what would you highlight on government bench that you think would be the most strategic for the team or would be something exclusive for government that opposition can't take for themselves? Okay, so I think that for the government side, if you're thinking about like specific conceptual nuances or characterizations, there are several things you should be looking at. The first one is, even though it is a post-conflict society, that doesn't mean that there are no longer any tensions. Frequently in post-conflict societies or what were previously post-conflict societies, you have a series of flashpoints that lead to a relapse into violence or conflict. Right? So that's one of the important things to note, especially if you're gov. It's very, like, I think it's very advantageous for you to say that um, and then say, therefore, we should not be creating or attempting to create something as you know, controversial as a national identity that could be another flashpoint of conflict. I think another, um, in, another nuance you can look at is in a lot of post-conflict societies or all, in almost every post-conflict society, you have a number of different sects or divides, whether they be religious or ethnic. And a lot of times people see these in many ways as their own national identity, right? Many ethnicities see themselves as belonging to different nations that just happen to be within the same state, right? So that type of characterization is important because if you have that, you know, social milieu interacting with a national curriculum that is imposing a national identity, it's a lot easier for you to draw the potential harms or, I don't know, harmful like reactions to that. Right. And that's, you know, I think that's the bulk of the pragmatic material that Gov can be talking about in this debate. So those characterizations actually are very important for the arguments. Is there is there actually room on Gov to just argue like this blanket argument that, well, instilling nationalism in general is just a bad thing to do in any context? Or would you consider that to be unstrategic for this particular motion? So If like in terms of whether it's, you know, contradictory, it probably doesn't contradict your stance, but I think it's not the optimal case, right? Because any sort of argument why or about why nationalism is bad in general and the impacts of that, like being harmful, will sort of be lukewarm in comparison to the nuance to post-conflict societies, right? Because I think the while a lot of the same conceptual arguments might apply, I think how they would play out in terms of how actors would respond, what the potential impacts would be for the security of the state, for peace, are a lot more extreme in a post-conflict society. So basically, the stakes are a lot higher. So I think the argument itself will not differ that much, but I think the impacts definitely do. All right. So I think you highlighted some of the arguments that government can already run, especially since it's very integrated with the context as well as the frame. I guess the next question would have to be, and I'm sure a lot of people are curious as well, how do you extend for a motion like this? Or what other arguments do you think would be easily overlooked that could be a winning point for government here? So I suppose the first thing that we can do is I think one thing that will often attempt like or 
oftentimes will be assumed but needs to be mechanized properly is just a basic question of what is the process of national identity construction, right? And I think that in a debate like this, you're not necessarily going to be creating entirely new arguments, but you're going to be grounding and mechanizing a lot of internal mechanisms that I don't think opening government in a, an average debate would typically get. So there are a number of questions that you can fill in. So I think the first one is the question of how is national identity constructed? So I think, you know, very obviously to a lot of people in the social, social science, but a lot of newer debaters might not know this, it is not democratically negotiated, right? It's people who currently sit in the levers of power, especially post-conflict, that are able to craft what the national narrative looks like. And many times this isn't necessarily going to be, you know, numerically democratic, right? In, like, and I think a good example of this would be, for instance, the national language in the Philippines. Like on paper, it is Tagal, like it is Filipino, quote unquote, but it is heavily influenced by, you know, a lot of the dialects in Luzon, like Tagalog. Despite the fact that if you were to perhaps look at the vast majority of people, I think most people, or rather not most people, but the most spoken language is probably some variant of Bisaya. So there are those so certain outcomes that would happen as a consequence of who holds power at, right after the conflict. So I think that's generally the first thing that you would look at. Um, I think another thing that you would look at under you know, the general government side is a question of how teaching nationalism is likely to you know, lead to the exclusion of specific groups. And I think that's because in any, when you're crafting any sort of identity, the, you're not just defining what you are, like uh, an identity is a question of yes, what you are, but a question of what you are not as well, right? So there are certain limits to an identity. If an identity did not have any logical limits, that would mean that it's not an identity at all because it falls under any other person, person under the sun, right? So it does have, have to be, to a degree, exclusive for it to be a national identity. And that's where you would lead to a lot of the harms of creating any sort of national identity, right? Uh, that would lead to a lot of harms, like, for instance, excluding people who may not belong to the majority religion. So, for instance, a lot of Muslims in the Philippines might experience negative impacts, right? While it might not explicitly be, like, for instance, the Philippines is a Catholic country, a lot of implicit narratives do support the idea of, you know, Christianity as being an embedded part of Philippine national identity, just to draw or illustrate an example, right? So those are the type of impacts, generally speaking, the Gov teams would be looking at. But I think what differs would be how they mechanize these harms, right? Or how they mechanize these, these pieces of material, right? So you could conceivably see a lot of teams on opening government say, that this is going to be very harmful because they're going to define it or national identity will necessarily be exclusive. When it's exclusive, other groups might not be or will be visibly upset, right? And you'd have all the harms as a consequence of that, right? I think a very important question is, how does that, sorry, how does that process of creating a national identity happen? And because of that process, who is it likely to represent and who is it likely not to represent, you know, in a range of different contexts. And then what are the impacts of that? So in terms of the primary impacts, you can have things like, for example, there will be a, de a degree of cultural erasure in most cases when minority groups feel like an identity that doesn't represent them is being superimposed over them. But I think secondly, you can illustrate certain harms like a lot of parents in society losing faith in the government and in their education system because they feel like the government and the majority is imposing an identity on their children and trying to culturally erase their like prior identity and all of the negative consequences that would happen as a consequence of the breaking down of trust in these institutions and especially an institution like the education system, where you need a peaceful environment for it to be a conducive learning environment for children, right? So the angle of also, how does that tension lead to or possibly harm the potential learning of the children is also an important impact that I think will be neglected in a lot of the debate. I love the argument about how exclusionary it tends to be, especially because when I think of nationalism, I find that an opposition team could kind of argue that nationalism could be anything. So that's what I would actually say, like the, the intuitive mm -hmm. um, argument for me on opposition is to say that nationalism could be anything. Um, the frame from the grand finals of La Salle Worlds, 
um, government there was talking about nationalism as basically just the belief in the nation state. And they were kind of pushing hard against the idea that it's exclusionary in nature. So if government side argues that, how do you think Um, opposition could meaningfully respond or adapt to this frame of what nationalism is as something that's exclusionary. Okay, so I think that honestly, like the way I would respond is generally two ways. The first thing I would do is just concede that to a degree it will be exclusionary because any form of identity will define against certain other identities. But of course, there are natural incentives to co-opt as many people as possible. The reason is, for instance, a new government that was just created, their biggest incentive is to maintain peace. Because even if you assume that they're selfish, uh, the their power is completely reliant on trust on institutions because things like the military is not yet formed enough or stable enough to rely on to quell opposition. So to a degree, you have natural incentives to inculcate people. So that's my first response, right? which isn't completely going to remove the argument of Gov, I think, but it mitigates and lessens the impact of those arguments to a significant degree. I think the second piece of material, honestly, is just to engage with the worst case and just say, let's presume that it will be, uh, or there will be a degree of cultural erasure, right? That it will be superimposed over the previous cultures or prior cultures of the children. I think you you would just defend that trade off and say that that is probably better than the comparative, right? which is a world where, you know, regardless of you belonging to the same state, there continues to be tensions because there's no unifying framework for, you know, citizens in society. You can say the adults, it will be very, very difficult for us to integrate them into this national narrative, but the children are a lot more moldable. And while to a degree, sure, it might, you know, be superimposed over their prior culture, the most important thing at this point in time is the stability of the social fabric and therefore, you know, on a balance of importance and impact, then we should prioritize that over things like protecting the individual identity of different groups. Yeah, so it seems that there's a lot here to be weighed between government opposition, even on the principal level alone, on what a state should be prioritizing during a post-conflict situation or context. So it, it makes me question as well, as opposition, how would you outweigh a lot of the principal benefits of government such as inclusion? Or how do you, for example, prove that better outcomes will take place for opposition? Like what certain arguments would you run that you think would be most strategic to prove those burdens? So what I would say or the way I would characterize it is if you look at post-conflict different fragmented groups, Normally, as if you let you know time run its natural course, the most or the people holding the most extreme positions are normally the older generations. Normally, if you look at it, the younger generations don't actually inherently have an affinity to that previous conflict, especially if you have an education system that eases them away from that conflict and more towards creating a cohesive national identity. Actually, you're you know they're unlikely actually to experience the principled harms of feeling like their identity has been erased or is being neglected, right? Because you have to recognize these are different from regular, like, you know, adults. These are children who probably don't know that much about the conflict or what had happened in the conflict, don't have any or have yet to have any strong personal affinity to specific um, identity groups. And therefore, this is the prime opportunity for us to reduce conflict without the necessary harms of them feeling like their identity is being suppressed. So that's sort of how I would, you know, frame that trade off. But I think the second one is just to be very hard line that even if a degree of cultural erasure exists, you would want to prioritize the peace and making sure lives are not a threat. If you were to characterize a post-conflict society, it's vulnerable to many things. So it's vulnerable to internal threats. So flashpoints can cause violence, right? And of course, if you're balancing whether or not you'd rather protect identities or the lives of most people, you'd rather protect their lives. But secondly, they're also facing external threats. So whether that be like direct threats, so maybe an immediate neighboring country invading because of the weakness of that new state, or whether that be external influence from major powers like China or the United States attempting to shape their political system. You need a framework that shields against that and nationalism or the idea that your nation state should be prioritized over all other different interests is a good framework to shield your state from that. Okay, so 
that was great because I was actually going to ask you like, how would you extend for this? And that's where I would usually expect like, oh, an IR extension. But yeah. that, that was the IR extension. Um, so I guess now what I can ask is, is there anything specific to like the educational system that you could argue for on opposition? Like it is the principle of the educational system to prioritize this kind of value or this kind of value. Yeah, I'm, and I think that the general way you should approach this is the education system, like any or any other organ of the state, is a tool for social engineering. And so the education system actually, I think, is the strongest tool for social engineering. In many other countries, you have students listening to the national anthem in the start, building loyalty to the state. So I think that in many ways, actually, you could argue that this is the education system functioning the way it should, not only in its interests to teach students skills to become good uh, participants in an economy, but safeguarding the social fabric in a society. In the same way, for instance, if you belong to a democracy, it's important in your civics classes to learn about the principles of democracy, the importance of democracy, because absent that, your society collapses. If nationalism is necessary to prevent the collapse of your country as well, like immediately after a conflict, um, it is perfectly acceptable and in fact beneficial for an organ of the state such as the public education system to be used in that exact same way. So I think you covered quite a lot in our discussion so far. And it made me want to know what matter particularly inspired you for this motion or what would you recommend people read up on if they want to explore the ideas further or find specific instances that they could use for a future motion like this or a similar one that they'll encounter in future tournaments. All right. So I think that this is obviously not a new motion. Like I didn't make this motion. This motion came out in a bunch of different tournaments. But I think also another interesting debate that had me think about it was um, in the Philippine World Schools debate, I'm not sure if it was championship or open, the World Schools tournament uh, locally that was organized by the Philippine team, there was a debate about the two schools under one roof system. So that's basically the system in Bosnia and Herzegovina where uh, Bosnians or Bosniaks and Croats stay in completely different classrooms in separate parts of the school, even though they're all under the same infrastructure because of the tensions that arise. So it's an interesting converse to that, or it's an interesting um, segue from that discussion. So it actually came from me actually helping one of the high school teams out and helping them prep for uh, that specific debate that had me thinking about this particular issue. So I guess that's one thing you can look at, the two schools under one roof system in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the Philippines also is somewhat of a good example, even though we don't have the post-conflict aspect of it. I think the important thing that you can draw from the Philippine system or Philippine history is the process of creating a national identity, whether it was you know inclusive or representative or was it exclusive. So I think that's another thing people can look at if they want to approach this topic with a bit more knowledge and confidence. So what advice would you like to give debaters that have difficulty with education motions because like this is all about us building like their confidence in debating these kinds of motions or under these kinds of themes so let's talk about education motions that like they do not have matter at all how do they still get to excel in those kinds of motions okay so i think in a lot of education motions, it's normally a question of two things. One is what social outcomes would you want the education system to produce in society in the long term, right? And the second question is what environment allows for a better learning environment or a conducive learning environment for students? And a lot of debates in education will normally revolve around those two interests. Uh, because those are the most impactful interests with regard to education, right? So if you look at any debate, whether it be this particular motion or, you know, the classic debate about whether or not you, you should make LGBT exclusive schools, the same is true. You will be discussing, one, whether or not the education system or the policy in the education system creates positive social outcomes in the long term, but also, to whether or not that policy creates an immediate conducive learning environment, right? So that's one way of thinking of it. If you want to be a bit more nuanced with these issues, you can think of the question of the learning environment as a more short-term interest and the social outcomes 
as a more long-term interest, right? So in areas where you have to defend one over the other, there are a number of ways you can weigh them against each other. So for instance, you can say that being the, or creating a most a co conducive learning environment is the most important thing, whether that be because it's the most immediate impact, whether that be because we shouldn't use the education system as a social engineering experiment because kids are vulnerable. They don't consent to, to being used in this manner or they cannot be consented, like, or they cannot, sorry, consent to being used as social battering rams in this way. That's one way you can frame it. Uh, conversely, the way you can frame it on the other side is that these long-term societal impacts are the most important, especially because if you're dealing with a lot of these students who will be you know, the subjects of these policies, they too will experience society and all of the potential harms if we don't enact X policy, right? So I think that's a very simple way to break it down to most new debaters. Education debates are a question of one, where do students learn better? And two, where do you get better outcomes for society in the long term? All right, so I think that covers most of the motion as well as most of the things that can be discussed when talking about education in general. We're really appreciative of you being here on our podcast and being a motion contributor for Debatable InterVarsity, especially since we share a similar goal of making debate education uh, a much bigger deal and much more accessible to everyone, regardless of where they're from. So once again, thank you so much, Mikel, for being here and for helping us with Debatable InterVarsity. And for everyone who's listening, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me.